to Fresh Ink. Thank you so much for being here. Shout out to Jeremy Dutcher and his team for letting us use that song. If you like the music, jeremydutcher.com. Um, this episode's called Art and Activism. Um, and so we're really happy that you're, you're joining in. We have some incredible artists with me today. I'm really excited to share space with them and for you to hear from them as well. Um, you know, we call this episode Art and Activism because, of course, we would like to respond to the national or the global conversation around systemic racism and, um, and how uh, we can investigate it or dismantle it or make sure that we can make work that empowers us all to tell incredible stories across our stages. These three artists have been in that conversation for a long time, so I'm excited to honor that and to uh, and to discuss more from them and to hear their work. I also want to acknowledge that I am in Toronto, which is also where Soul Pepper stands. It is the land of the Haudenosaunee, the Huron Wendat, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit. I want to acknowledge they are the original storytellers of this land and to reaffirm that we will celebrate Indigenous artists and storytellers at Soul Pepper. Uh, I'm really excited to introduce you to uh, my co-host for today. Uh, I'm really happy that she said yes. Andrea Menard is an accomplished Métis singer, songwriter, actress, and writer. One of the stars of AP APTN Netflix series Blackstone. She's a five-time Gemini-nominated actress, a 15-time music award winner for her four critically acclaimed albums. And her TEDx talk called Silent No More has reached over 126,000 views. It's beautiful. Andrea's latest single, Silent No More, is an anthem to end violence against women. As a creator of original work, Andrea's one woman, mus one woman musical, The Velvet Devil, toured across Canada and was adapted into a made-for-television movie for the CBC uh, series opening night. She wrote and starred in Sparkle a 70 minute holiday TV special that broadcasts on APTN for seven consecutive seasons. And her symphony show, I Am Shokate, debuted with, debuted with Regina Symphony Orchestra in 2014. Andrew has acted in over 20 debut plays across Canada, including Kevin Loring's Thanks for Giving and Floyd Favel Star's Governor of the Dew. Andrew is a proud member of the Métis Nation of Canada, born in Manitoba. She carries the Ashinabu name Shokate, which means Fire woman. Hello, Andrea. You unmuted me. Hi. Hello, Tanchi. Nice to spend some time with you, Wayne. Thanks for having me here and be part of this sacred circle. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you for, for, for joining us. Um, I asked Andrea, I said, yeah, would you, would you want to come on and talk about art and activism? And she mm. said, yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so first of all, I want to start by just asking how you're doing and how you're feeling. I'm, uh, you know, whew, I'm, I'm all over the place, just like every Indigenous artist right now or Indigenous person or people of color, you know, and I just like to also acknowledge that I'm in, I'm on the unceded territory where I am right now. I'm not in the Métis homeland where I'm from, but I'm living now in Vancouver, which is the unceded territories of the Squamish, the Tsleil-Waututh and the Musqueam people. So I just acknowledge where I am in this beautiful territory as well. So how am I doing? Oh, whew, I've been all over the place. It's um, full of, you know, just like when we're, when we really get down to it, so many of us are filled with grief or rage or I just can't stop sleeping. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, you know, because I'm a peacemaker at heart, this is, you know, maybe that's because I'm a Métis person and I, I take that very seriously, this mixed heritage. I'm a peacemaker at heart. And so I feel hopeful because I'm seeing more people awaken than I have seen in a very, very long time. And that's hopeful to me because the more people that gather in our circle, the, the wider and the bigger and the stronger circle we, we become. Mm -hmm. True. Yeah. I feel the same way. It does make me feel hopeful because we're not at the point where we're talking about if there's a problem, we're talking about what is the solution, which is a different yeah. space. It's a totally different conversation. 
-hmm. And that's, you know, some people are saying, you know, from the, from the non-Indigenous community, people are taking on the fight that we alone had been taking on forever. So they're recognizing, I have some of my white friends going, oh my God, I had to go home and cry. Like people are so racist. People are so stubborn. I went, yes, thank you for taking that conversation away from us. Thank you. <laughs> you know, so we're sharing the load more than we ever have. And that's a great relief to our community. Great. Well, I'm gonna let you, since I know you work with Kevin, I'm gonna let you introduce him. Well, I am honored to be working with my brother here, Kevin Loring. Um, I'd like to introduce him. He is one of our, one of our best. Kevin Loring is an accomplished Canadian playwright, actor and director, and was the winner of the Governor General's Award for English Language Drama for his outstanding play, Where the Blood Mixes in 2009. The play explores the intergenerational effects of the residential school systems it toured nationally and was presented at the National Arts Center, where, we now, where he now serves as the first artistic director of the Indigenous Theatre at the National Arts Center. And if that isn't enough, he is also the artistic director of Savage Society. He is an Eklamuk, I think I said that right, I've been practicing, Eklamuk from the Lytton First Nation in British Columbia. And Kevin has had more than a dozen of his plays produced across Canada. And that includes some of the community work that he does that is very important to his heart. So please welcome Kevin Loring. Hi, Kevin. Hello. <laughs> where, are you, where are you located right at this moment? Uh, well, I'm really honored to be living on the unceded territory of the Algonquin peoples uh, here in Ottawa. Of course, I'm from Tlacatmuk territory in the Fraser Canyon. Uh, as you said, I am, I am in Tlacatmuk um, and I very homesick right now. I usually go home every summer and do a community project. Um, mm -hmm. And we were supposed to be there. Actually, we were going to be in British Columbia the entire summer this year. Uh, we had a bunch of stuff lined up, but that didn't work out, did it? And so we're stuck where we are. Uh, well, we are, you know, fresh ink. Here we are. We're going to be um, listening to new work. This is what this whole platform is about. Thank you, Wayne and Soul Pepper. It's about fresh ink. So tell us uh, what you want to, what you're writing, because it's something that obviously we have no idea what you're going to do. So what is it that you want to read for us today and give us a little bit of background? Oh, wait, before we do that, let me introduce oh. Kim. So oh, I'm sorry. Can... Yes. No, no, no. That's okay. It's our, uh... We're improvising here. So I want to make sure that, so that Kim can jump in the conversation because I'm sure she'll have something to say. Kim. Sorry, Kim. No, nothing, right? No. Really, rarely I have something to say. <laughs> Kim St. Harvey is a proud to ill Sukkotin Tunaha Dekal woman. She is a fire creator, indigenous theorist, and cultural evolutionist. She's completed the BFA program at UBC and is currently doing her master's in creative writing at UBIC. Kim is interested in indigenous creation works, dismantling and troubling colonial and neo-colonial systems with a particular focus on the resurgence of indigenous matriarchal led systems and frameworks, especially those amplifying the emancipatory journeys of those enduring state oppression. She also really is hoping to catch a fish this week. I am. Hi, Kim. <laughs> She's also my friend. Hi, darling. Hey, how are you? Hi, everyone. How are you feeling today? Uh, you know, I'm really grateful for the space that you've created. I was at Surplus Herbie's into Kamloops when you called me <laughs> trying to fix my lure situation because um, every good fisherman blames their tools. And so <laughs> uh, I was really grateful to hear your voice and uh, hear and know the work that Fresh Ink is doing and, and giving us a platform. And uh, you know, I've, I'm dealing with some family stuff and family responsibilities right now among, among dealing with, um, you know, remote communities. Both my Anaheim and Upper Nicola uh, are on quite strict uh, shutdown and lockdowns because um, there's been a lot of trauma and history with uh, settlers coming in and causing a lot of havoc with um, pandemics. 
um, particularly in the Silk Teen, uh, Anaheim was like decimated by smallpox. And uh, there was a scare there. Upper Nicola was on quite a lockdown. So uh, we're kind of feeling, I'm feeling a little bit less nervous, but I, you know, I bring that up because I think this pandemic is very different for indigenous peoples uh, and the trauma, historical, current, uh, that it can bring up. So uh, I'm driving past your territory, Kevin, saying hello for you every time I go up to the Chilcotin. Um, but it is, it's um, a particular time right now for Indigenous peoples. Mm -hmm. Right. So this is the <laughs> I'm going to pass it back to you, Andrea, then. Okay, yeah, well, Kevin, I kind of asked you, asked you a question. I don't know if uh, you need me to reiterate it or you're going to be starting, uh, you're going to be the first reader for this. So I'm just wondering if you want to give us a little background on what you're going to talk about or is there anything you want to set up for us? Well, I mean, I had two pieces, but I know we, have a, we don't have a lot of time, but uh, Kim wanted to catch a fish and I have one about fishing and I have another one that's a bit more uh, violent and political. And so <laughs> I don't know which one to go with because the violent and political or the, 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 the more, uh, I don't know. So one's a poem and one's a bit of a short story. So maybe I'll just, uh, I'll try to, I'll rip through the poem first real quick for Kim. So maybe she can catch a fish. This one's called uh, The 65 Pounder. And a lot of my work, like Where the Blood Mixes, there's a poem that I wrote that is actually in, became embedded in one of the, some of the rewrites and became the world of that play eventually. And so a lot of my work, like the poems and the songs that I write and the short stories that I write, end up finding their way into the scripts that I write as well. So uh, this might be the start of something deeper. It's called The 65 Pounder. In the valley of the rattlesnake, fishermen focus their gear, set nets dip and angle, brave rapids and rocks for a glimpse of silver glory, opportunity to provide. Rapid, liquid tips lick into air, spray through narrow fluid veins. The last rays of the day reflect off polished ore boulders, rusting along the river cut gash in the land, inevitable. Mountain shadows fall on me. Clear water runs a million gallons a minute, crash, slash, rise and smash against the land. Infinite whirlpools miniature galaxies spin. The universe unfolds, refolds again. Laminated currents twist through time down this river valley. Wind and all the emptiness that fills it twists too. Gusts and breezes, flashes of shadow slip past, below, underneath, almost unnoticed a muddled reflection on the other side of the water glass. The Chinook people queue up in a watery hole, mouths gaping, waiting for a shift, for the rhythm to break, to catch an opportunity home. Forever pilgrims from birth to death and back to birth to feed the land they come from, to renew their vow to return, to lay the foundation species of perpetual sacrifice, the 65 pounder swims. The fishermen spoon the river's edge with nets dipping into the rushing current, dipping, dipping, dipping for a feast. Practiced arms tied to strong backs with sinew and muscle, locked to bone, crude harnesses tied to stone, boulders, polished from 10,000 years of ropes tied round them, rubbing back and forth in the summer heat. This place of harvest, this sacrificial altar, this sacred site, blood on the rocks, already feeding the land. Mouths gape, eyes still frantically search for a way home, and then stop and stare empty. Practiced arms dipping, dipping, dipping into the lips of the canyon, pulling at the river's edge, hoping to catch a feast, to spill the blood, to feed the people. 
tails and fins, gills and scales, a nova of silver in the green blue river cool, navigating the secret highways under the water glass surface. Forward, ever forward against the pouring current, against the rush and the thrust, a million gallons a minute, the 65 pounder swims. Homeward, ever homeward, back to the beginning, against claws and rods and lines and nets, oils and fuel and plastic teeth chewing from the inside, tails flash forward ever forward, against all, with all, her people pushing on, ever forward, the 65 pounder swings. Dip, 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 the fisherman works his net. The fisherman sings his song. Flash, splash, a pulse of current in the eddy sends the signal to push. Scraping the serrated edge of the canyon, she thrusts forward, following the scent home. Along the flooded streams under water paths. Dip, dip, the hoop of the net occupies her path. Cook stay, stay, and cook stay. A million gallons per minute, the force of time. Practiced arms, the weight of her people, the hungry land, the ceremony, the explosion of muscle, the obsession, forward, ever forward, fierce, sacrifice. Silver and blue, water and bone, blood on the stones, home, 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 bookstage. Thank you. So that was uh, the 65 pounder. Like I say, a lot of my work starts or comes out of poems or poems or, you know, and songs and things like that are a part of it. Um, a lot of pretty much everything that I do is about home. When I write and when I create, it's, it's some on some level and, and is a reflection of, of, of that. Um, and so uh, that's another example of that, that. A lot of my work does that, right? It's, it's about that place where I'm from. So I don't know how much time that took up. Probably that's it. Is that correct? I got, I got more time? I think you do. Do I? What do you think, Wayne? Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. I mean, All right. So I'll, I'll really quickly, I'll launch into this. Hopefully it doesn't take too much time. Uh, okay. This one's called Geronimo's Last Hand. Oh, by the way, disclaimer, I have an older brother and his name is Geronimo. But that's not who this is about. This is about the historic figure, Geronimo. <laughs> What's the name again? It's called Geronimo's Last Hand. Hand. Geronimo, Buffalo Bill, Tonto, the Lone Ranger, and General Custer are playing. Oh, by the way, today is the anniversary of Custer getting killed. Just so you know. <laughs> uh, Geronimo, Buffalo Bill, Tonto, the Lone Ranger, and General Custer were playing poker in a bar somewhere north of Wounded Knee. Buffalo Bill had a pair of deuces which he cussed at under his breath as he scratched his scrotum through his buckskin chaps. Custer had flushed hearts. He hummed to himself and winked at the Lone Ranger when he thought no one was looking. The Lone Ranger held three queens close to his nose who could smell their perfumed hair and powdered faces. Tonto grunted his vacant eyes, watched Geronimo suspiciously. Geronimo was holding a dead man's hand in his left and a straight flush in his right. The dead man's hand still bore a wedding ring. An inscription on the inside of the band read, Jesus is Jewish. Buffalo Bill folded and ran to the bar crying for booze. The bartender gave him his last ounce of whiskey. Bill thanked the man and then promptly shot him in the face. The bartender survived and became a Cyclopean freak show attraction in Buff's, Buff Bill's Wild West Traveling Circus. Under the table, Custer put his hand on the Lone Ranger's upper thigh. He licked his lips as he proudly displayed his flushing hearts. The Lone Ranger smiled at this because he thought his queens were prettier than the general's flush hearts, especially saddled next to a pair of rigid jacks. Tonto grunted again but said nothing, having already surrendered his four deuces for fear of upsetting the White Ranger. Geronimo squeezed his lucky mummified hand and launched his straight flush directly into the rolling mounds of wealth 
Splayed over the table with a vicious roar, he laughed at the other players in disgust, reached out over the field of battle and poured his, the precious loot into his waiting saddlebag. The other players were aghast. How could this be? Even Tonto began to protest. After all, his little white warrior was supposed to win. How is it? That's how it always works. They all began shouting insults at Geronimo, calling him a cheat and a coward and cursing his name. They said soon his name will be nothing but a cliche, eroded by overuse and misunderstood by those who spoke it. Soon enough, people will mock him and impose a false monosyllabic legacy upon him. They will forget his two spirits and even when his perpetual poetry of speech and his strength of will and the love of his people is forgotten. All the while, the white folks laughed. This angered the great warrior. He spat on the table where the cards lay like graves. Insulted, Custer rose from his chair and drew a pearl-handled -hand gold-plated pistol and pointed it at Geronimo's head. With an eager grin, he whispered, the only good Indian, and he squeezed the trigger. But to his surprise, the bullet missed its mark, ricocheted off a stuffed grizzly's glass eye and punched a hole through the skull of the lone ranger, spraying his hypothalamus onto the floor. Tonto screamed. He looked into the vacant sockets of his favorite white man and began to weep. Geronimo roared with laughter, his eyes wild and fierce. Shaken, Tonto looked into the eyes of the great warrior and he saw his own reflection in Geronimo's eyes, tiny and misshapen. In those dark orbs, he wasn't a man, but a shadow of the people, a mascot for a dandy in white polyester. A rage erupted in Tonto's belly a rage that had been festering for several network seasons. Geronimo recognized the smell of that rage. He knew its taste. In a flash, in an eagle scream, Tonto transformed into Jay Silverheels and turned to the general who was still firing rounds point blank at Geronimo, all of them missing their target. Such was the strength of the great warrior's medicine. In one swift motion, Tonto reached over the table, or Jay Silverheels reached over the table and grabbed Custer by his golden scarf. Custer released another round in the direction of Geronimo, who stood green, but that too somehow missed its mark like a magic bullet, depositing itself into the head of a passing president. Jay Silverheels choked Custer until he dropped his pretty pistol. Then Crazy Horse, who just happened to be passing by the bar, saw what was going on and drove his hand into the general's chest and ripped his heart from his splayed ribs, throwing the empty carcass to the floor. He then raised the still beating heart into the air and let out a war cry so blood curdling that Buffalo Bill urinated in his pants in front of everyone. Crazy Horse then began to eat Custard's heart like an apple. When he was done, he thanked Jay and Geronimo with his victory song and rode off to bingo with his baby mama. Custer's golden head lay face first in the lap of the Lone Ranger. Jay Silverheels declared to the universe, I am no longer Tonto the white man's dog. I am the Thunderbird and I will render the world asunder. Geronimo grinned and answered his brother's war cry. Together their voices rose to the nation of the sky and filled the world with awe and dread. Children wept, women cried, miscarried, crops failed. Men cried out in fear like children waiting to be punished by an angry stranger. Terrified, Buffalo Bill pulled a shotgun out from behind the bar and shot the newborn thunder being in the back. Thunder, the thunderbird fell to the ground, paralyzed. He tried to crawl away, but Buffalo Bill, urine still dripping from his pants, yanked on Geronimo's leash, causing him to involuntarily draw his 45 and shoot the wounded Thunderbird. Stillborn, Thunderbird lay on the floor of a dirty country in Western Bar somewhere north of Wounded Knee. Geronimo's heart was crushed. He had forgotten the leash that Buffalo Bill held about him. He forgot his bond to the drunken hunter. He forgot that he no longer owned his life. In a rush of time, Geronimo became old, his hair gray and fell long. His face became more and more haggard. His time on the trail of tears came back to haunt his body. Buffalo Bill raised the shotgun to Geronimo's head, determined to put his old pet and an enemy out of his misery. Without looking into his eyes, he pulled the trigger. Once again, the shots would miss. 
Geronimo's medicine power would not allow a bullet to harm him. The 12 gave shots, 12, 12 gave shots passed around Geronimo's head. They buzzed around the room like a swarm of angry bees, searching for a warm body to embed themselves. Buffalo Bill was the only one they were able to find. One by one, they buried themselves in Bill. They filled his organs like empty beer cans, killing him dead. At this very moment, somewhere in America, a white buffalo was born and a young boy saw this. Geronimo surveyed the carnage before him. A slow smile stretched across his face. He unsheathed his buckskin knife from his belt and severed the leash of the dead drunk hunter. His saddlebag too heavy to carry, he dragged it through the doors of the bar and out into the waiting sunlight. <laughs> yeah, Kevin. That wasn't too long. Nice. No, that was perfect. Oh my gosh, where do we begin? <laughs> where did you begin? Where did you begin with that story? Where did it come from? Oh, I don't know. It goes on. There's other chapters to it. It goes on and on. And like this, I have these all of my works. I have such a slow process. So I like it's something will start years ago, and then I'll forget about it, and I'll drag it out, and then. In this time of COVID, I've been looking at some of these older pieces and rewriting them. And so this one came out of uh, not so much of like a, it's like an, uh, it was just a, a dream that I had in my, sort of like a dream anyways, of, I just had this image of these characters sitting around playing poker and, uh, and just let my imagination fly with what might go down in a sort of mythical, uh, magical mythical realm um, where time and space don't really matter. And, or the, the, our perceptions of who these characters are and their historical significance sort of all come into conflict and come into play around a poker table. And then all hell ensues. <laughs> Truly. <laughs> but it was also like that sort of idea of like the modern myth making, right? Or the, or the modern uh, creation story or, mm -hmm. uh, a, a, you know what I mean? Like that sort of flavor of like all kinds of things. But sort of, in a, again, it's like in a, in a country western bar it, there's like you know as it goes on and on and on there's other you know pop culture sort of references that feed into it that have you know it goes on and on and to me i i i love how you you tend to do this really well is that you um just because our myths have been twisted and and discarded and so you take an existing myth and play with it and you know shape it as well that's a great skill you have and you're funny, you know, you, I, I just, I want to know because um, as everything you do, I mean, sorry, but the fish one was just pure nature. That was just, that was so the Niklamuk boy, right? Klamit. How do you say it? Oh, that's it. I'm like, it's not, anyway, that's to me was like, so your people, so your, your lineage, right? But tell me about humor. You just, have this capacity to take really tough subjects and make them funny. <laughs> and why is that important to you? Like you, that, that seems to be um, a style of yours. I mean, I've been in one of your plays. I know that little elbow funny, funny bone you have. So tell me about humor, how it plays in your work. Um, well, I think it's, it's vital. I think that, uh, I think that if, especially in play in, in works, I mean, uh, I have a play that's coming, well, it was supposed to come up in September, but of course that's been canceled. Um, but it's entire, it's a comedy, you know, like uh, it's a satire actually, uh, but it deals with land claims. And so I think that, that there's, with humor, there's always a way in and, or a way to the light. Uh, mm -hmm. Even when you're in a really dark place or dark subject matter or do, wrestling with really heavy material, the laughter is a is a necessary survival technique. Of, you know, you know this um, as Indigenous folks. You know, and that there's and as all human beings, right? As all folks, that that humor humor helps us through really hard times. You know, I've been over the last few years. I've had to had to attend a lot of funerals, and um, it's been a really rough go in our family. Uh, but uh, there's always laughter, even in those dark, dark, hard times. And that's what gets you through. And uh, also like, when you're dealing with heavy subject matter, you go to the theater, like for example, in a script, whether you're reading it just for, you know, like a poem or a short story, but when you're in the theater and you go to, like, if you're going to be 
you know, if you're going to wrestle and really be able to digest those really heavy, heavy subjects and, and, and hard scenes, that humor just is, is like the, um, what do you call it? The, the, uh, it just helps you digest that, those, those, those really tough, tough things. Tough meat. <laughs> like the spoonful of sugar. <laughs> yeah, like an aperitif. <laughs> exactly. You know, I um I don't think I knew that you that you your entrance into your plays was through other mediums like a poem or a short story. Um why I mean I just kind of like you to tell me a little bit more about your process. You know, I mean you uh, why do you say it's a long process because it has to shift from that particular I just take way too much time. Like I I literally will will work on a like the uh, Little Red Warrior and His Lawyer is the play that was, gonna, was supposed to go up this year. I've been working on that play for 20 years. Like mm -hmm. nobody in their right mind should work on a play for 20 years. <laughs> but I keep every four or five years, I take it out, dust it off and rework it and rework it and rework it. And no, it's not quite ready yet. Throw it back into the thing and then pull it back out again. So uh, I kick things around and I, I come back to them. And if I, if I don't feel that they're finished, I let them go and then come back, you know. Uh, I mean, the other play that, I mean, the play that you were in, Thanks for Giving, that was a very fast process for me. That was three years. And I really wrote the majority of it from like November to that to September when we staged it, right? Like that was an incredibly fast. And, and for me, that was a very unsatisfying writing process. So I continued to rewrite it after we staged it at the Arts Club. And then I think that's important for any new work, right? Um, so when it was published, it, it was a, it was, uh, it was two and a half drafts past what we staged at the arts club. Okay. And even now, when I look at it, I go back and I go, that whole second act needs a rewrite. And so <laughs> the next time I get a chance to stage it, I'm going, before I do that, I'm going to rewrite that act. Um, and I just feel that like, it's really important, especially as playwrights. Um, once we publish something, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's the end, you know, like I still want to tweak things in where the blood mixes. Like I, I just have that, maybe that's just a writer thing just the, the the need to go back and like no it's no, this bugs me i gotta fix it mm -hmm. uh, so it's just a lot i just have a long process like that where i i like to go back and, and look at things and, and see where they're sort of weak and try to fix it that's um, the maybe that's the theater, right it's the beauty of the theater it's not film it's not uh, it's not locked we're right. all beings we have to relate to our moments and yeah, yeah. it's living um, Absolutely, and I, I think it's a living document, right? Like a, 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 a script is really, uh, it, it should remain a living document and it should be, uh, for my, I mean, sometimes you just gotta let it go, go okay, okay, done. Um, and that's a very important uh, step as well. Um, but I, I have a hard time doing that. <laughs> do, you, do you think that the short story is going to be like a, uh, are you sure it's going to make it to be a play or is it gonna potentially stay a comedian? I never really thought of that one as a, as a play. Um, I thought of it more as a short story or as even if it were to do anything, I thought of it as like a bizarre anime, like an animation kind of thing, mm -hmm. right? But uh, uh, it could be at some point, I mean, it would, it's pretty dense. It goes on, there's like, you know, all of those moments are like these, like these pop icon figures sort of, uh, you know, it goes on and on and on like that. It's pretty epic. I love the genre What's that? Well, I just love the, the the genre feel on it, the take yeah. on it, you know, and playing with history in that way. It almost feels com it feels like comic book. It feels it feels like so many pieces. And yeah, already, I, in the chat, I, someone's saying that they see it as a play already. So. Oh wow! Yeah, like I I uh, uh, I actually do think of it that piece in particular. I think of a graphic novel. Mm -hmm. um, I see it very much as like like a like I see it in the cartoon in a sort of cartoon way. You, you asked me earlier about my process. My process, I often see. The big picture, like I have a, I have a big picture vision of what the piece is, and the writing process is about seeing what part of that vision works or doesn't, and, mm -hmm. and chipping away like a sculptor at how how that that story unfolds. But I often um, will see like we have like the inspiration will allow me to see the whole thing, and then the writing process is getting my ass into a chair and actually having to write the damn thing, mm -hmm. which is the most painful part. Right, like I, I have a, but once I'm there, I find that it just sort of flows. It comes out of me pretty quickly. <laughs> the hardest part is actually getting to sit in a chair and focus. And um, right. often I, what I do, when I go home to write often uh, when I can, when I could, 
And I have a little room uh, in the Totem Motel across from my mom's house, room three. It's a little self-contained bungalow. And I do it all, like I wrote the entirety of Thanks for Giving in that room. In, I mean, I wrote the, the full draft, like when it was at the first draft, I wrote it in three days in that room. Wow. Um, just 16 hours a day, just like, cause it was there and it was like, I'd written about 20 pages of it. And I, I wrote and I wrote the remainder of the, the draft, uh, of the rewrite and the draft, which was about 81 pages at the time in three wow. days. Wow. Well, um, Kim, Kim also, I know you also, humor is also a thing you, we've spoken about you know, as far as that, that, you know, the medicine that goes down with the pieces that we're writing. And also you, you, I've also heard you talk about just the need to have uh, your characters live in a space that has more levity and, and, you know, in that way, or, well, specifically, actually, I can read a quote from you that says, um, if you kill us on stage, if you make us cry all the time, if you betray us as victims, how do you think the rest of society is going to see us? How do you think that will impact the way that we're treated? I think that's dangerous. Um, so humor. Yeah, I, I, I firmly believe that. And that's like why I got into writing because the plays that I was being asked to do and the short stories was just really trauma informed. And now I've kind of like talked about it as trauma porn um because and when you look at it now there's even really nuanced conversations on social media happening around retweeting violence against black people retweeting these videos that are horrendously um violent and what are the ethics of that what are the repercussions of that what does that mean to normalize seeing uh bipoc violence and what does that mean as our artistic practitioners to invest money stage it and then sell tickets to that i have deep questions around the ethics and responsibilities of killing indigenous women at the rate we were doing it on stage of enacting violence against indigenous women at the rate we were doing it and i didn't find that there was a robust conversation about that occurring and you know even with the example and like trigger warning for bipoc folks around the nascar driver who had the noose hung in his garage that people were starting to show images of it and i was like what is like what is this like what is this need to insatiate ourselves to see it to see the violence and you know violence against indigenous people to me got way too normalized it's way too accustomed it's way too pedestrian and i think that takes our humanity away and our spiritual capacity to say that is too much that is violent that is wrong and the reason that i started writing comedy and writing like anti-trauma or trauma more transformed because the characters are right are not um vacant of challenging experiences but to me my responsibility as a storyteller is to transform that to show that to people so that they can understand what that transformation needs i don't need to write a play about sitting in trauma and crying my face off and getting killed i don't know what that does i don't know who that's for it's not for me i i, I it's not for me and so I got really particular about saying like, who am I writing for? What is it doing? What is it um, igniting? And what is it amplifying? What is it normalizing? And for me and like my female friends, my femme friends, my like non-masculine friends were saying, there's not enough content of us joking around, loving, being sexy, having body sovereignty. There's just not enough of it. And so that's where my work came out of. And I, I still, uh, it makes me very weary around how much violence is normalized in the art practice. Um, why we feel the need, you know, uh, you know, my friend was saying it's getting a bit fetishy. Why do we need to see BIPOC people in so much pain? What is, what is that about? What does that feed for us? And uh, I don't, I just have no interest in it. I don't think I need to say any more about that when the lived experience is much more compelling, is uh, much is um, happening at the rate that it is. And so if I'm supposed to balance the scales, the trauma of indigenous people is here and the joy is like this on the spectrum. And I'm just gonna spend the rest of my career filling up indigenous love, indigenous joy, joy is resistance, rest as resilience 
all of these components that as an indigenous woman, I was told and fed through the Canadian theatrical um, production and curation of seasons that uh, I should just be living to die and cry and probably get killed. And I'm not about that. That's not what I was raised to be. That's not why I'm born on this planet. I was raised for much more than that. And we need to see that. Yeah, I definitely can relate to, you know, I had to stop looking at social media for a while because I just had a moment where I was like going to make breakfast for my kid and I saw some horrific image of a man getting beaten. And I was like, I just can't, I can't, I can't. it's not, yeah. And it's, um, yeah, and I've been seeing a lot of people saying that too, please be, let's be careful about what we post. Um, well, thanks for sharing that. And uh, I know there's, we'll talk more about that because I know there are all, all other kinds of uh, pieces that you are bringing into the ecology that is um, to, to sort of formalize that a bit more. And so I let's think talk about, just to speak about Kevin's piece, what really resonates with me in knowing that journey is like, Kev, you had that line, like in that first piece, the spe species of perpetual sacrifice. You know, the, the, the journey of the fish and the way that indigenous people are. And like, I love hearing you talk about Kevin, the way that we are so deeply connected in reflections of our land and the journey of the fish that get up to your territory, that get up to my territory and how like grisly and almost like worn down those fish look like when they're going to spawn. And how that to me is like a nuanced, complex version of what enduring violence is and then also being in service to. I think those like that's the responsibility of an artist, of a storyteller, of a practitioner to expose, illuminate and um, amplify these messages in ways that aren't so um, horrific and uh, explicitly gory. I'm not a mirror. I don't need to mirror the news. Mm -hmm. What are you, but why don't we jump into your piece? Let's hear what you're writing these days. What okay. Um, I'm just gonna move you guys to the side. How do I do that? Okay. So the piece that I'm working on is uh, called Break Horizons, a rocking indigenous justice ceremony. It's held in a living treaty between the Arts Club Theater, uh, the Citadel and myself. Kevin was actually a, a, a treaty uh, witness at the ceremony in 2018. And it is about um, indigenous justice and the high incarceration rate of indigenous women by the Canadian state. Um, it's held in this kind of indigenous futurism genre um, because, you know, actually I saw, I can't remember exactly what she tweeted, but one of my professors or professors at UVic, Danielle Geller talked about indigenous futurism, not so much interested in, in the technology of it, but like the spiritual and mental possibilities in this genre. And I think that there's something that, that intrigues, intrigues me about what that is. Um, so I'm gonna read a bit of it, but for context uh, to help build the world, uh, I'll read a little bit of in the uh, fire creator's notes is what I have before the play. This is draft three. I just said to my grad supervisor, Kevin, uh, what I'll defend is probably draft six. So this for me is very much in process. Um, and in the fire creator's notes, I have the big bounce is a hypothetical cosmological model for the origin of the known universe. The concept of the big bounce envisions the big bang as the beginning of a period of expansion followed by a period of contraction. This suggests that we could be living at any point in an infinite sequences of universes. In 2003, Peter Linz had put forward a cosmology model in which time is cyclic. Linz suggests the exact history of the universe would be repeated in each cycle in an internal recurrence. You know, some critics argue that while the universe may be cyclic, the histories in each universe will all have variants. Eternal return is this theory that the universe and all existence and energy has been reoccurring and will continue to reoccur in self-similar form in an infinite number of times across infinite time or space. And I'm very much interested in having astrophysics and quantum theory speak with indigenous philosophy and pedagogy and ideology. I think our elders and like Western astrophysicists 
are speaking the same language. And so when I see them talking about collapsing of time, about you know these theories of infinity, these concepts of sequence of universes and dimensions, like I said on Twitter the other day, I would love to have an elder who talks about indigenous cosmology and a Western astrophysicist sit down because I think they would just be like, mm -hmm, yeah, we're talking about that's the same thing. And I think that astrophysicists are kind of our most incredible, um, uh, how do I say this, philosopher, philosophers. And so this break kind of takes place in this world. Uh, and I'm just going to read it. And it's a little bit long, but I hope it's funny and I hope you laugh. Um, the Salish sisters see the fires. So the big opening has just happened and we open with uh, Led Zeppelin's Whole Lot of Love. The main girl character is wearing a black latex cat suit and we have a res house band on stage so that's been like way down inside like that's just finished it's a really epic opening the sailor sisters see the fires of the silco teen come through why they try to tackle her to the ground we see the silco teen war in her she ignites and is at the rollover temperature earthly alarms begin we hear sirens approaching and why the silco teen screams she goes in for attack against something is it her boyfriend in the present her territorial enemy from 400 years ago or a predator from 7,000 years ago she collapses in the effort and she is arrested the ship Shifter takes her downstage. The witnesses become the judges and why the Silco teen speaks directly to them. I was defending myself. I was being attacked. The Salish sisters come behind her and say, we have been under attack since you've arrived. I've been under attack for many lives. To know how I got here, you must know the fight and pain of my peoples. The judge says, you've been found guilty of murder. And why says, and what about you? The judge says, you've been sentenced to life imprisonment. Why? You killed six of our chiefs, judge, without parole for 25 years. Why? You used biological warfare against my peoples. You decimated us with smallpox. We hear the Silco teen war cries. The judge yells, order. Why? Whose order? What about your history of violence? We hear the Silco teen cries. I said, order in the court. Why? You deny us intergenerational justice. These are not my laws. My positioning as an enemy of the state is your doing, judge. Take her away. Shift. We're at the head smashed in Buffalo Jump on the Blackfoot Nation. The shifter turns into a tour guide. The Salem sisters at the Healing Lodge are on an out trip. The tour guide says, and of all the buffalo jumps known from across Western North America, there is perhaps none more imposing and more lethal than head smashed in. It is the matriarch of all buffalo jumps. W says, it's like a lethal weapon. She does a martial arts move. The tour guide continues. It's a paragon, a model of excellent. Z says, kind of like us, they all laugh. Communal hunting was at once courageous, harmonious, and dangerous. For thousands of years, once or sometimes twice a year to participate in hunting, you would be in close proximity to warriors you attempted to kill in a previous battle. These gatherings had much business, trading, and of course, ceremony. Y says, so it was like buffalo business and like boning time. The tour guide stops and the shifter presences himself. We see the haunts arrive. The tour guide and the shifter say, the bones teach us the earthly events that transpired through the breaking. These stories imprinted on the fabric of the universe. X goes, excuse eh? Scarlet says, what happened here? She points to an image of the buffalo jump where there are no bones. The tour guide and the shifter say, there was a time when there were no bones. For approximately 5,000 years, there was nothing. No trace of a single buffalo ran off this jump. Where did the buffalo go? Wrong question, the shifter says. Where did the people go? The shifter, who is no residue of the tour guide anymore, says, since time immemorial, the matriarchs would have gatherings, gatherings of many nations with all the mammals of the matriarchs of the earth. At these gatherings, the council would keep the order of the world. We believe in this breaking darkness. They recognized they were overhunting. The balance was off. So they made an agreement with the mother buffaloes to cease hunting until they could stabilize their herds and peoples. We hear thunder. The relationships between the species is complex and delicate. If one component goes out of balance, the interconnected network of the aliveness will collapse. This is the universal order. Scarlet asks, what did the humans do? The shifter says they entered into one of the longest ceremonies of the earth. The matriarchs were concerned that they got too close to an extinction, extinction for if the buffalo go, so do we. So they started the 5,000 year ceremony. The res house band begins to play and the shifter goes, do you remember Scarlet? Scarlet closes her eyes. I, I don't, I don't, what? So Shifter goes, call the matriarchal gathering of nations Scarlet. I, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm just a fucking inmate. 
look into the land and to your blood past the emblems look into the rock they speak with their vibrations awaken them gather the matriarchs leave me alone shift all right the tour guy says that concludes our tour please take your time she looks at scarlet and says remember to look into the rocks and don't forget to check out the gift shop at the bottom of the building on your way. Purchase a t-shirt to take with you. Remember to shake your bag a few times. You don't want to take any spirits out with you. The tour guide dissipates. Why? The fuck is up with that tour guide, Z? What is her shit? Shake out the bags? What, are we going to pick up Marley's ghost or some shit? X, fuck your wife. Why? I'm going to just shake my booty. Why start shaking her butt and the Shayo sisters laughed and joined in. Z says, fuck, the spirit just squirted from your ass. Why dances and jumps around and starts squirting spirits. Spirit, spirit, spirit. Scarlet goes to the edge of the jump. It's windy on the portal. W comes out to meet her. W says, you ain't looking so good these days, Scarlet. And Scarlet says, for 5,000 years, there was nothing. What kind of ceremony is that? W, a real long sweat. I don't know. A gathering, a gathering of the past, look into the rock. W says, do you hear that? Space time collapses. The Salish sisters of the Healing Lodge get pulled into the collapse. Scarlet starts to sing a code switching song between Silk and English. She's calling the mammal matriarchs. The gathering of nations is coming to order. The shifter comes in hot through the portal, dressed dimensionally different and speaking a, langu a language that's not quite English, shifter. You cannot make this decision. The humans will not survive. Too much will be lost. X and Hunkaminam says, hello, sister. It's good to see you. The shifter says, it's good to see you. It's, it's good to see all of you. Scarlet puts the back of her hand to her own cheeks and extends her arm out to the beings. Shifter, but you are making a grave mistake. No world has ever behaved this way. In Slat Slim, Z says, which is exactly why we have to respond with this cultural evolution. The shifter says, you cannot evolve that quickly. Why? The White's Queen have positioned us to have to respond this way. They start and sustain the Imperial War. In Shohetmik, W says, I do fear much knowledge will be lost. What if our future ancestors forget where to look? The energy shifts and Scarlet stands. In Silk, she says, much will be lost, but it is the only way. Put it in the blood. The shifter screams, they won't see it, Scarlet, but put the rest in the rock, the land, the earthly elements, they can find protection and teachings and our cultural heritage there. Surely they won't forget that. Talakwea, the orca matriarch starts to click. Scarlet yells, Talakwea, please help me. This will be their end. And the orca says, dear one, it has to be this way. We can see the queen's people are consumed by destruction. Ravenous beings hunger for the death of the human world. Then stop the human queen. Don't let it get to that point. Scarlet leaves the orca and approaches the shifter. It doesn't have to be this way. Scarlet, a true evolution for us humans can only happen if we ignite it within ourselves. So many will die, die by death of forgetting what it means to be alive. Scarlet, we both know we cannot force a consciousness. We have to awaken to the connection. Shifter, but you will be in human form, but you will get lost in the transfer. Scarlet says, then come find me. We have been able to find one another since the birth of the cosmos. The shifter said, this could untangle us and I can always pull knowledge when I take human form. Scarlet says, I believe in you. So the shifter says, I've never tried it when it's imprinted on the blood and the transformers have been locked in the rock for so long. What if I can't break them out? Then I'll meet you in the next universal expansion after the collapse. No, you don't always remember when you travel through the event horizon. You certainly won't if you're trapped in human form. The gathering begins to close. Scarlet says to the shifter, you have been the greatest friend the universe has ever gifted me. The earth drones in the process of imprinting indigenous knowledge into the blood begins. The shifter collapse and cries out to the matriarchs. It's sludgy, thick, it hits you in the gut. Shift, we're in the healing lodge. Four adults in custody. Harriet, the facilitator of the mass program says, hi, hi, everyone find a seat. They all mill about and are absolutely not listening. Y says, and I was like, fuck that shit. You wanna talk about me being a good fucking citizen? You can't even spell that fucking word, you unlit lollipop. X says, what'd he say? I says, he whipped out his dick and said, you wanna fucking lick something then? Here it goes, okay, everyone, please find a seat. W sees the chairs out in a circle. What do you mean find them? They're right here. A light flickers and S's enters. Harriet says, just find a seat. 
Why do we always have to sit in a fucking circle? Literally, any seat makes a circle jerk easier. It's because we're gonna play Duck Duck Goose. Who are you calling a goddamn goose? I'm the goose. Z starts flying around the room, flapping her wings and honking like a goose. X, I need a fucking sucking duck. Mime's a blowjob. See how many licks it takes to get to the center of the Tootsie, bitch. Why? I always wonder what I would do for a Klondike bar. And Zed stops from the other side of the circle and speaks to Y. You murdered someone. Y says, Yeah. So where's my fucking Klondike bar? Harriet, okay, the room cools. And in a longhouse voice, she raises her arms out and says, welcome women of the healing lodge. The women are very confused. Her arms are still out. X gets up from the chair and slowly walks across the circle awkwardly and enters Harriet's arms and goes in for a hug. Oh, Harriet says, no, I, sorry. I was just, um, X, hola, doesn't even want to hug us. Harriet, oh no, it's not that I didn't. I, uh, I was just told there was no touching. Y says, no, there isn't. So don't get all priesty on us. Harriet, oh my God, you seismologists are all the same. Psychologists, yeah, them too, all the same. Actually, I'm none of those things. You aren't one of those hug -a thugs Harriet, excuse me? Z, those inmates aren't so bad people? Harriet, oh no, I am one of those people. Then let's fucking bring it in! W, X, Y, and Z come in for a group hug. And that's a bit much for Harriet, and the warden walks by. Excuse me, Harriet. Muffled him from the center of the group hug, Harriet goes, yes, warden Buffalo Bone. I explicitly told you no physical contact. Y looks to the warden, looks back to Harriet. We tried to tell her, Buffalo B. We tried to tell her. Harriet, okay, we're off to a great fucking start, aren't we? The Salish sisters are surprised to hear her swear. Harriet goes, this is a prison, not some garden party, is it? She winks at the witnesses. X says, it's actually a healing lodge. W, same fucking same, locked up. Harriet is sensing something and says, five, there's supposed to be five. Harriet, yes, I know there's four here, but they're just supposed to be five of you in jail. X says, it's a healing lodge. Scarlet enters the doorway. She has taken the form of a young silk woman. Shift. The shifter says, oh my God, it's you. Why? Yeah, there's your fucking fifth element. That's some dumb fucking honky movie. She walks up to Scarlet and greets her, putting the back of her hand on her cheek and making the gesture. The sailor sisters are confused. W says, what the fuck did we just say about touching people, you moron? Shifter says, it's been too long. Scarlet says, I just got here. Harriet sees Scarlet has carried too much of her previous form into this human experience. She's part human with the residue of the orca. She's frail, starving, lost, separated. Shifter says, you're so far, so old. W, what you talking about? She looks 12. Shifter, come sit. We're just about to talk about being here. The shifter looks at the witnesses and the audience members locked in their pain alone. The shifter says, we're gonna talk about their prisons. X, it's a healing lodge! Shifter says, yes, this is, isn't it? Can you tell the witnesses the difference between a prison and healing lodge play, please? Y goes, who? The house lights come up and the sailor shifters look out to the audience and the witnesses. This is a dimension breaking moment. And the shifter goes, witnesses, the sailor sisters, the sailor sisters, sisters, the witnesses. They relate bear witness and the Salish sisters look out and smile and all at once say, yo, what's up? What good? Hello, word. Now we move on to something else. <laughs> so you said you're in draft three, so you, you already know where this is going. Oh yeah. 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 It might end with some Marvin Gaye. All right. Wait for it. Well, so this is, I mean, Kamalupa also had shifting time, right? Like you've already been playing with this idea. Um, and yeah. it's, it's interesting that, you, I mean, you know, it makes me think about Afrofuturism, which also was a response to civil rights. And, you know, with all of the things, genre, like Kevin's piece, like, you know, Black Panther came out of the writing and, and, and Basquiat and, and this idea of, not just talking about slavery, but what is the world and, and what is time and how can we, so it's, it's, it's very fascinating. Where, why do you think you have three more drafts? What is? Uh, this world is giant. So I, I know that there are, I'm the person in the audience being like, what if this happens? Why didn't they do that? So I see these ends. So I guess I could do this. This is my whiteboard. And so that's every question I have to answer right now. So that's why more drafts and also there's five Salish languages in this piece mm. and so I have to go and do that good work to put it in understand the translations um, and then the other thing about this piece is that 
I've always seen it like Kevin, this vision of it, there's a vernacular of dance and movement, and then there's also songs. So it's a, a mix of singing of uh, contemporary and old school rock songs, because I'm not um, ignorant to the fact that this is an arts club in Citadel commission. You know what I mean? It's a very different audience than the Kamloopa one. And for me, I had this concept of for displaced indigenous people who might not be conscious of how to travel time and go to their homelands and learn songs, what are our anthems? And I'd said the, sh the, the similar thing for me is that when my like non-indigenous friends, dads and aunties get together, they're all singing like Bob Seger, Led Zeppelin, CCR, the Rolling Stones. And I wanna find moments of connection. And so there's this thing I'm playing with about rock, rock and roll, transformers in rock, vibrations, which leads us to this thing that I've also been thinking about that inspired ideas come from a place beyond thinking. You know, you feel love before you know love. I really feel that true transformation comes from like a vibrational, physical embodied shift in knowing. And the, the other big piece about this is the movement piece. You know, when they have this matriarchs gathering and they're coming in and their indigenous futuristic regalia, what does that movement look like? What does all of that look like? And so the Arts Club and the Citadel before all this pandemic had uh, invested and were planning to invest uh, significant funding to workshop this piece, to have a musical workshop, to have a physical workshop, and then to have a play workshop, and then one more to put those three together. And so even if I just did those three workshops, like Kevin said, like I would be doing draft after draft after draft. And so I think what's going to hit the deck when this goes up is probably draft seven or eight. With Kamlupa, it was draft six, but this is a, this is a bigger piece. Hmm. Well, I'm interested because Kevin, you intersected with um, Kim making this living treaty with the Arts Club and Citadel. And for those of you who don't know, it was uh, something that they saw that was created um, for the wellness and spiritual safety of Kim and her team um, to be signed um, to basically also like for for the understanding of that, but also for practical things like for the budget of the elder, for any any practices that you wanted to include. Um, that those would all be part of that treaty. I'm curious from both of you, Kevin, um, what well, well, makes me first Kim, how soon did you know that that was something you wanted to do? And- As and soon as I signed the non-treaty for Kamloopa. <laughs> oh, right, okay. So was that- I, I just realized that there are ways of doing business in the Canadian theatrical world that doesn't align with my values, that doesn't align with my ontology, that doesn't align with my creative practice, and signing a contract where one party has basically a majority of the power, and the playwright has like a little bit of power here. When you read that language, it was like, and we'll get to do this, we might not do that, and if you tour, we'll do this, and we get it. And I was like, this is how we're starting this relationship? this really vulnerable relationship of this is this is how you guys want to do this and i'd kind of just said like oh whoa 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 i don't relate that way i don't work that way why is this not this agreement at the center of how we're going to create this peace our relationship needs to be very healthy our relationship needs to be transparent. We need to have a respect and a and at least an acknowledgement of the power and difference between a large two the, the two largest institutions in Western Canada and like little old me with the blog every once in a while. We needed to talk about that and talk about uh, how I was going to feel sovereign and powerful and having agency within that relationship. Um, and I'll be honest, we've uh, in almost every email. At first I was like, oh, this might just be really performative. We might not actually like utilize it and drench ourselves in it. I would say in almost every email, if not every phone conversation, we talk about it. We talk about the values, we talk about the budgets, we've talked about how we've aligned ourselves. And in, I would say like in many times, I have felt that I could speak up, speak my truth to that power because of that treaty. Um, and I just knew in terms of my responsibilities to every indigenous person who's incarcerated right now, every indigenous female or femme who's felt oppressed or um, oppressed in two systems of continual genocide, that this wasn't just about me and my power, that I wanted to make sure that everybody who signed on to the project could look at that treaty, could read the values and say, this is what we're about. And if you can't 
uh, live up to this, you're, you're breaking that relational artistic treaty. And I wanted to be really transparent about the way that I work so that when I invite spirits and bodies and people onto my teams and I become a leader on that, I ensure that their safety at all points and that they know even in my failures, which I will fail them, um, that I set out to protect them and that I will take responsibility if that doesn't come to come to fruition, as will the producing partners. That this whole skirting, shirting, shirking, not actually taking responsibility when shit hit the fan, we're not about that. I'm not about that. I respect the people whose lives I asked to come into this work and the treaty protects that. And I'm really proud of that. And Kevin, as someone who's um, producing now and, and uh, curating indigenous work, do you feel like you had to, because you're coming into NAC, shift the way that that model worked or what's your response to sort of yeah well what i really appreciate about that that offer that uh that kim made with the treaty is the taking control um or or finding a way to find a a, a level playing field with those big players as an individual artist and to to embody her own practice in in the way that that is the foundation of that relationship and so a lot of the work that I've been doing, I've been involved in uh, the, the pact equity conversation, actually. Um, we are, the Indigenous theater is the only, I think Indigenous, we're not actual full members of pact, we're um, affiliate members, but it has allowed us to be at the table. And so uh, we've been pretty active, Lori and myself, in trying to reach like this, you know, we have these, these, these documents, right? Like these, these, of these agreements as associations and as institutions and things like that. And so at the institutional level, trying to, trying to, like they're, they're, you know, the, you know, the contract, the equity agreement uh, between PAC and equity is up for grabs at the moment. And there's been intense negotiations and things like community engaged practice has historically been excluded. And yet, you know, we, my company, Savage Society has had to dance around how we engage with artists to work in community. Um, in relationship to, uh, you know, their, their association uh, with equity and, you know, literally they're associated with equity and equity being the association that's supposed to represent their interests. But we found how, uh, how deeply um, that relationship actually impedes the work, impedes us engaging in community, impedes us working in the way that we want to work. Uh, as indigenous artists. And so uh, at that level, we've been doing a lot of work to try to, to rewrite the script on how we engage. Um, and that's been a really hard journey. Um, but again, it's like having, you know, we're at the table, so we need to use that positionality to shift, to shift the, the you know, the, the power structure so that we're able to work in the way that we need to work as indigenous artists. And so that work goes across the board. That work also is like uh, incredibly necessary in the institution that I'm in, embedded in, right? Like at the NAC. And so uh, we've been doing that work as well, how we relate to the community here, how the NAC relates to the indigenous community in this city, um, on this land that, they, you know, in the Algonquin unceded territories, right? So a lot of that, a lot of the work that, that I do with my community back home, I've been trying to find ways in which that that will translate relationally to the folks here, um, those sort of those ideas. And uh, that's, that's an intense amount of work and we're just in the very, very beginning of that relationship. So I think that what, what that Kim's treaty is, uh, has tr uh, sets up is, uh, is the terms of the relationship, right? Um, it formalized, codifies the terms of the relationship. And I think that uh, across the, you know, across the land, I think that that relationship um, is up for grabs right now. How do we, how do we codify it that so that it benefits us and doesn't impede our work and impede our processes? You know, and so we've been a part of that quite a bit, actually. Kim, yeah, I just want to say I don't think I've actually talked to you about it. Is that the treaty was such a a forward step because just from my own experience of the Velvet Devil, this green girl from the bush, this Métis kid, you know, I I had brutal experiences, and so to, for your voice to be so intact, for your that just shows what twenty years of you know <laughs> of this um, colonial system, like of of 
people my age and the ones before me, you know, just to see you be so vocal and have your voice intact is just, I'm so proud. So proud. Thanks, Andrea. And I think you bring up a really good point. And I always like to honor the work of the people who came before me, in particular the matriarchs like yourself and Margot and Marie and Yvette and Lisa and Halemia and Lindsay, who's coming up, uh, and uh, Monique, um, all of these Indigenous women who held space for so long, which has actually allowed my work, this work, our work to continue so I can continually pass it down. And that's the only reason the treaty really was allowed was was because of the ferocity and the resilience and the combatant of the white brutality against Indigenous women in theatrical Canadian ecology that this occurred. And so I, I extend that back to you, Andrea, for the space that you've uh, fiercely held and and unfortunately I feel like the generation before us the Canadian theater has not bared witness to all of that good work and um, yeah from my ancestors to yours thank you for that good work mm. Mm. yeah it's so important right and you know as uh, somebody comes as an African person we have an oral history a lot of that work you know I came in I went into university not feeling like there's an African Canadian monologue to audition with 20 years ago mm. of course come to find out Janet Sears who became my mentor had written a, an, a play that traveled everywhere it's just a question of publishing and writing down our stories and continuing to honor our, our the folks who've come before us it's it's mm. crucial you know I just read something um I was doing some history on Black Theatre Canada which burnt out in the 90s and they did um a all Caribbean Midsummer Night's Dream before I was born that swept the Doras. And I, just felt, and I just felt sad just because I was like, I still feel like we talk about those things as groundbreaking, but like for them, they'd be like, what, you guys are still talking about that? We did that, you know? Yeah. It's important to continue to tell our stories and the stories that come from, from before us. Yeah, in that way. I would like to ask about the treaty. Like, do you think that is, a short-term solution that some that like uh, there's some people in the, in the chat who've already been saying like this is a it's an amazing model for redefining relationships and negotiation for how to manage resources work do you think this is something like a short term until it becomes a ma muscle memory or are there other things that you uh, that you think just all theater like there's something things that need to be adapted on a um more general i'm just curious about if you think you're going to do that in the future um well, I think there is something to, I hope it's not the only tool. I hope it's not the only offer. I hope it's not the only framework. It's, it's something that I offer and, um, you know, I do use them in other ways. And I hope that, you know, it's on my website. People can take a look. I'm just in the middle of refreshing it because it's a living treaty. So our relationship will evolve so that it's not signed in stone. And four years later, when you were all different people, that somehow that's supposed to apply again. So I'm just in the middle of a refresh. It works for me, it works for this relationship. It works because the Arts Club and the Citadel bought into it. They actually agreed to it. They live by it. There have been many emails where it's like, our bad, our bad, our bad. I think within the first week I was like, hey guys, remember this treaty we signed? And I was like, right, right, right. It is uh, inconvenient, it is messy, there are missteps. But for me, because it's so relational. And I also, there was a, to me, a part of me that the treaties across Canada, there was uh, relationships have been so fraught and so violent and so um, ignored between indigenous and non-indigenous peoples. A part of it too was a reclamation to say that we can re um, claim these practices that our ancestors had missteps to, that they were so broken, they've been so ignored, they've been so, um, just drained of all the integrity. I really wanted to invest that in. And that's why when I say the process is the art, sure, what I wrote is one part of it and we'll do a play. But to me, keeping the integrity and the power of that treaty for the rest of my life is something that I'm invested in. Like I kind of said to some the, the like femmes of the Kamloopa, I'm not only write three plays because I have to be in relationship with everyone that I work with for the rest of my life. Caitlin Yacht, Sam Brown, Yolanda Bunnell, the entire fire company. I owe them my time, my respect, and my relationship for the rest of my life. That's what it means to be, to go into a production with somebody. And so with Break, she's a big mama. And so I don't know how long, like she's this fierce um, entity that uh, I, I don't ever want to break that treaty. You know, I think it maybe we'll have to write when I'm like, whatever years old and croaking on to the next dimension going and this is all the arts club you're released you know what i mean i want to keep people on the hook with my work so 
I don't know. I hope that, and I know that the indigenous theatrical community is so intelligent and so innovative and indigenous technology and intelligence is thousands and thousands of years old. I think if I can hold some space around power and us reclaiming power for many people to come in and reimagine these relationships that suit them, that's just a part of my job and my work. But it's really relational and it takes a lot of time. And, I, and even in like switching the paradigm of like people thinking the play is the thing. The play is the one component of many things. The treaty on opening night or when it gets published, I'm gonna be just as proud of that as then, you know, I don't know, the, the fog machine working or a good review, whatever that means. And so it's so, um, and I'm humbled to know that I'm uh, misstepping often. Uh, I'm learning it because the, there was just a couple of things in the sector that I said, this is just not working. And I have a responsibility to the next generation to try and create modalities, frameworks, structures, and relationships that make sure experiences that happen with Andrea and that generation aren't the status quo, aren't dogmatically upheld that we say, hey, this is not a cool relationship anymore. And I think in the climate right now of this redistributing of power, or at least like what you said, Wayne, just saying this is a problem. There's power in difference here. How we create systems out of that, I'm, I'm very interested in. Almost more, as equal to writing plays. I've, I'm like fascinated by that shit. You know, there's something, um, you know, as an indigenous woman, I can't help but hear, you know, the similarity. So Kevin, you said, you see the vision, you see the dream first, you see the big picture first, and then you have to go, what's the first step? Oh, this one. And then you end up getting there. And same with you, Kim, is that you're saying, I may only do three because the vision is so big, is what it sounds like you're saying. The vision is so big that it's not the, how many plays am I going to, it's about how can I honor every step that gets me to that vision? Because it's not just a play. Oh gosh, if we could just be artists and just write a play and act in a play right oh my gosh we don't have that luxury and none of us we don't have that luxury so the fact that you are honoring the big vision and that means that it's gonna take longer you're gonna have harder conversations it's gonna go sideways you're gonna throw shit out you're gonna it's you're literally <sighs> honoring the big vision and to me that is the work like you say that treaty is a huge step in this play or, or you wouldn't do the play, you know? So honoring that vision that is so indigenous <laughs> and in a way that is also educating, educating the larger culture about the vision matters first. The dream that my people and my ancestors are giving me is more important than the individual, you know, um, or the season. I think about that a lot with models of success too, like that I realized that actually I had a, an aha moment somewhere down the line. And, you know, I'm only a year and a half into artistic direction. I'd be interested to know, Kevin, if you've ever felt this too, that uh, that there is a third sort of models that I've inherited that are very capitalist that are about like success means how much you grow and how much you, and I, and I realized I was like, oh, wait a minute, the model I'm actually, the, the, I have to, even the evaluation of the success has to be changed before I even try to attain it. Because to me, for me, it's just been, a, it's been about voices. It's been about actually a, a, a real cultural hub that can, that can really empower us as a community. So I found that in the work as artistic director, the process, spending my time in the process and how to make the work is sometimes, it feels like two jobs because it's, it's taking up so much time because how can we actually just put the content in there if the framework is not actually empowering the content? Yeah. I don't know, Kevin, how you feel taking on this huge job, like, you know, how, if you feel torn ever between those two things. Absolutely, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of pressures um, that just, you know, are inherent in this, any kind of, this type of job, right? But also that the structures are set up to, to evaluate success, as you said, in a certain way. And for me, what is really, exciting about work is whether or not it's relevant or not. And as opposed to like, you know, there's an, ex, there's, a, there's an excellence sort of paradigm out there that has, oh, it's so excellent, it's amazing, it's so well crafted and all these things. But for me, it really excites me is work that is relevant, that maybe it is a little rough on the edges or maybe it is a bit like more community informed, but its resonance runs deep because it is so relevant. It is so relevant to the people, uh, to the community that it's coming from, to the people who are doing it. 
Um, and that resonates far deeper than whether or not it is virtuosically excellent, right? I mean, that has a, that of course is a, is a factor, but it's, it's less important to me. Um, but of course, the, the tension of being in a, in a massive colonial institution, literally the National Arts Center of Canada, right? Like it is, it is, a, it is a, you know, a very, you know, it has a very particular role, right? And has a very particular history. And for, you know, for the first time having an indigenous um, company embodied in it, uh, there are natural tensions to that, right? That, that are really often difficult to navigate. Um, but we do our best, um, and but always try to find the route to being what is the best way to do this, like for our people. What is the best way to presence this work? Um, what is the best way to include community in these conversations and in this uh, in the the necessary transformations that have to happen in order for us to be uh, supported and feel safe in that space, right? Um, and so that's continuous every week, every day kind of work. <laughs> Uh, right. Um, and, uh, but, uh, you know, we have an amazing team. So I, I don't do this alone. I certainly, you know, we sit at the board table, which is, it's a real rarity to be in those, in a, in a, those, those positions. And, and uh, there needs to be more and more and more of that across the country, more, more of us, more of uh, our, you know, Indigenous and BIPOC folks to, to be at those board tables and in those positions of power to be able to shape the industry that we're a part of in a way that reflects our values and, and our communities and our folks. And that is continuous, ongoing, every day, every week kind of work. And so that's part of the gig. And I know you know this, um, we feel it. Those of us, you know, in, you know, doing this work, we feel it every, every day. And so it's an important, it's a really wonderful time to like the, something that was said earlier on in the conversation that the other folks are taking up a lot of the uh, the shouting that we've been doing for so long, right? Because I'm, to be honest, I'm fucking tired of it. Uh, and it's it's about time that somebody took up that labor so that I could actually get to work and do some art uh, and to and to try to make you know try to make the space that we are occupying safe and welcoming and powerful. And yeah. You know? I mean, you talk about. Kevin. Oh, go ahead, Andrea. I was just going to say, Kevin, I think that's why it was just so nice to hear you talk about your process as a writer. Like, I just wanted you to be able to talk about that as an artist instead of having to be the head guy, you know? So it was, that's why it was so nice to just hear you talk about it. Yeah. No, and, I and thanks. Uh, thanks, Wendy, to inviting me, you know, like to, to have the opportunity to be an artist. Um, I'm often just, you know, like you say, like I'm, I'm I'm in this position and I, and I, you know, but to be an artist is why I'm in this position. I came here to do art, to, to help, you know, make space for art in that space, right? In that very particular institution. But, you know, again, to that too, like I also want to see, our, you know, want that institution to be a, a vessel for work to go across the country and to be able to support work in community, right? Like, and to, I always have this vision of turning the NAC in, inside out. Kind of like when you take a mango and you cut it and you like splay it open so the fruit is on the outside and the skin is on the inside, you know, in many ways, I like a lot of people feel that place is kind of impenetrable and sort of like a sheltered um, a bunker for art. Um, and so I really have this idea of, um, of finding ways and there's there's programs within the, that institution that do that. The, the education program uh, is expanding and we're really excited about that uh, and we use that as a as a as a vessel to get us into community more. But uh, that's really how I look at the position is, is try to find ways to subvert and turn that place inside out. It really is about images, isn't it? Like, I'm going to take that mango, by the way. I like that. I'm going to meditate on that one. But also just simple, simply like moving from the pyramid to the circle, you know, like that's the part that I'm like, where, where, where's the people? You know, it's just the, the, the shape. Speaking of shaping things, I mean, literally the shape, you know, it's uh, partly all of that needs to be investigated so that community can be at the high, highest level. Because as, we, as we've all seen, it's, it really takes representation. Like what you're doing, Kevin, it's so beautiful, you know? And um, it's because you're in that, you have agency and you know, um, and you go and support Kim and doing these, it's like, it's, it's, it's really what, what really matters. But we're here at 6.30, I could go on forever. Um, I'm really thankful that you guys joined me. I definitely wanted it to be art in the middle because 
really you are you've all contributed activism is just naturally part of it as you've been you know really working against the dominant culture to make sure that these stories are heard so thank you and thank you for being here and for sharing and um, like me? yeah I liked it so much can the poem's like 30 seconds can I read that dumb hot dog poem oh my god the hot dog poem let me hear it <laughs> okay so this was written out of like my dirtbag indigenous life and it's called How to Slide. I'm really interested in investigating in dirtbag shit and indigenous love. So it's called How to Slide. So it goes, I buy my bow and arrows at Canadian Tire. I get my wood at Seville Lev to burn my eighth fires. I drink bubble Lee with Petro can purchase cupcakes. And I threw out all my soft mocks because that shit is so fake. I sport Carhartt clothes with custom coastal bling. I own precious moment prints because I can't afford Christy Belcour's dope ass things. I'm looking for a slick cocoa one to give my kitschy culture kicks. Make sure his macaroni hot dogs are cut up real thick, squirt, squirt you better catch up because i'm searching for a thick braided red bro to fucking step up <laughs> <laughs> i mean i don't know how else we were supposed to end this show that was definitely it done <laughs> mic drop <laughs> <You're having me. laughs> bars i love it uh thank you so much uh love and energy to you and the work you're doing kevin and to all of you thank you for being uh, with us. Thank you all of you out there for being with us today. Um, enjoy your week and your weekend and be safe and happy. Thank you so much.